Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host Jason Turner. I'm available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. Now welcome to chapter three of my five chapter free class that I have put together using previous episodes about lambdas and general C++ topics for Christmas and New Year's of uh, 2019, 2020. So this episode is chapter three and we're going to start by going over the homework questions from the end of chapter two. Now if you don't want any spoilers, now would be the time for you to go back and watch chapter one and two before continuing on. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to give you the solutions to these questions, or at least some possible solutions to the questions from the end of chapter two, before we get started with the list of shows for chapter three. Thanks for continuing to watch this class. I hope you're enjoying it so far, and let's get going on this. So this is the where we left off, and there will be a, a link to this stuff when I am done that will be in the notes for the video. Um, but this is where we left off, and we had just watched chapter two with these six videos. And the first question was, can we implement this higher order function in C++ 98? Now I am going to quickly comment out this chapter uh, chapter two question two down here and leave this up here so I can go ahead and start playing with C++ versions. Now right now this is in C++ 2a if you can see this over here and it is compiling with no errors or warnings of any kind. So let's just go ahead and take this down to C++ 17 and nothing changes. So the idea was implementing these higher order functions in C++ 98. Now we know that C++ 98 doesn't have lambdas, so let's go ahead and just implement them first starting as if we didn't have lambdas. So I have gone ahead and replaced the first lambda with a struct called add that has this print operator. And this is exactly what the lambda was doing for us. With auto function parameters and auto return type deduction that lambdas offer, it was simply providing an operator print call operator overload. Uh, now this doesn't compile at the moment because here, add is no longer an object, it is now a type, so I need to create an object of this type. And we can see that it doesn't compile because I have a const function here, this is a const lambda, and if we want to be consistent then this should also be a const member function. Now it compiles with no problem. Okay, we've replaced the first lambda with a struct, let's go ahead and create a second lambda here. Um, now this is the lazy lambda that takes three parameters. So let's go ahead and give it the three parameters. Now, what does this return? This actually returns another lambda here that has these captures. So let's go ahead and create another lambda. And this is, it doesn't really matter what it's going to be called here, this is an unnamed one. And this one, let's see, we need this to be const, let's not forget that. This one has three member variables, one of type func, one of type left hand side, and one of type right hand side. Now I am capturing these by value down here, not by reference or anything like that, so this is the correct way to do it for parity with the original. And it's going to have its own call operator, which takes no parameters and is itself const. And we will return the result of calling func with left hand side and right hand side. Now um, I'm going to remove this lambda here 
and we just have our lazy struct. Now again, we have the same deal that we have a type instead of an object. So let's just go ahead and create an object of type lazy here. And our return, we don't have a return statement here. So what do we need to return? We need to return an object of type inner that takes the func, the left hand side and the right hand side. And it copies all of those in. And now we have done the exact same thing just without lambdas but we are in C++ 17 mode. So let's go ahead and take this down one more notch to C++ 14 mode. And everything compiles exactly the same. In C++ 14, we still have uh, aggregate initialization, which we are using here, and we have full auto return type deduction, um, and we have templates, obviously, so this isn't a problem. So let's go ahead and take this down to C++ 11 and see what breaks. Okay, we don't have auto return type deduction in C++11. That makes some of this more difficult for sure. We do have trailing return types though. So we can say that this is the decal type of left hand side plus right hand side. So that should solve the problem with this call operator in C++11 mode. This one, however, um, we don't have any way of naming this inner thing, this inner class here, uh, local class, that is, that's inside the function. We just have no way of giving its name outside of here. Its name doesn't exist here, and there's nothing that we can call it. So we have to move this struct up a level here, which we can do. This isn't a problem. Let's go ahead and reformat everything. There we go. So this now needs to become a template class. And this is going to work, but we still don't have the auto return type deduction here or down here. So let's go ahead and now this one is going to be the decal type of calling func with left hand side and right hand side. Now, if that seems a little redundant, it's because it is, and this is one of the reasons why we would say that C++14 is a bug fix for C++11. Okay, now we have to get down here. So we've got our call operator that is templated on these three parameters, and we can use a trailing return type, or we can just put the return type up here where the auto is currently. So I'm going to go ahead and do this, because I know once we get to C++98, we're going to have a bit of a problem. So this is going to be an object of type inner, of func, left-hand side, right-hand side. Okay, and we got there. So we still have basically the same semantics. We're just having to create this object called lazy and this object called add each time instead of the compiler doing it for us. And we're at C++11. Now if we take this back to C++98, what don't we have? We don't have trailing return types, so we can't do decal type here. This is going to be a problem. Um, we also don't have trailing return types, so we can't do decal type here. This is going to be an even bigger problem. Um, and we don't have auto down here, which is going to well, this is going to be a problem too. But um, yeah, so when I call lazy, construct an object of type lazy and call its call operator, then I am calling this thing. So I'm going to have to return this inner object here. So let's uh, take this back, well, let's see, let's try to get rid of as many autos as we can to start with. So this immediately becomes just like, what do, what do we even do with this? Um, giving it a name is, is, is a bit of a pain because we need to know the types of each of the parameters passed in here, this left-hand side, right-hand side. So let's just do this. 
and not even try to capture the thing right now. So we've simplified our code a little bit for ourselves. And this is in fact the kind of thing that you would have had to have done if you'd used boost bind back in the day. The type that was returned from you was something you had no way to work with. And using boost bind in C++ 98 was actually uh, very painful. Okay, so this doesn't need any help here. Um, no, that doesn't need any help. This auto return type deduction here is definitely going to be a problem. Now what we would tend to do is we would see things like this binary function helper class that was deprecated in C++11 and removed in C++17, where you would do things like create your struct that inherits from binary function. And the entire point is so that something making use of your binary function that takes two parameters and returns uh, some type is that you could then have these type defs available to you, result type and second argument type and, and such. Um, well, that doesn't really help us here because our call operator is templated. Now we could make the struct itself templated, but if we did that, then it makes uh, the calling conventions here quite a bit more difficult to deal with. So we kind of, with C++ 98, have templates with effectively auto type deduction going in, but not coming out. And this becomes, again, a real problem. So what we need to do is say the return type of this thing is somehow funks return type and that's going to then require a type name here to clarify that now of course funk doesn't currently have a return type so that's unfortunate and also what in the world are we going to put up here so let's go up to add this is what our funk is ultimately and we just have to make a decision here. We have no way of deducing what the return type is going to be. We can force the user to specify it, or we can make an assumption, like say it is just the left-hand side of this thing. And then we can get rid of this trailing return type here. And this is the kind of decision that we had to make back in C++ 98 days, which would then lead to doing things like this because uh, what's the point in taking two different param types if you're going to force the return type to be one particular thing although we still need two actual parameters of course all right uh, so this gets us a little bit closer but we still don't have our return type here so what i'm going to do is create a little um, helper I guess that says it's another struct struct called return type and I'm going to make this a templated struct and I'm just going to do this right now because our options are quite limited and we don't have using in C++ 98, so we have to use a type def here, which is always a pain because it's backward from what you would expect it to be. So I am going to say that left-hand side becomes type. All right, I think this is going to work. So if I have func return type of left-hand side and right-hand side and ask for its type, Oh, now I have to, fortunately with modern compilers, I get this, use template keyword to treat return type as a dependent template name. Okay, thank you, modern compiler, for telling me that I needed the syntax. Ah, that is because I am no longer returning the result of this expression. There we go. We have RDI, the first integer parameter argc, plus four. Now the main problem that we still have is we have no way of really naming this lazy thing, but we got pretty much there. So our two compromises are, we have no way of naming the return of calling this call operator. And we had to force the return type here to some known value. And uh, this is basically what you see from the standard plus 
template that was provided by the standards in C++ 98, um, but it has grown throughout the years, and that is something that we could have also taken into account here. Okay, well that was crazy long. I think we're more than 15 minutes into this episode, and it's just this one theoretically simple example. Oh, you know what? I never actually confirmed that this compiles in C++ 98 mode. Here's hoping it didn't. Why not? Ah, it didn't because we don't have braced initialization syntax. All right. So, lazy, call the constructor. That'll get rid of that problem. Add, call the default constructor. That should get rid of that problem. Enter, I need to provide a constructor that is going to look like this. Did we get there? We did. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the second question here. I say, explain the difference between these two different constructs, pair one and pair two. Now we're in C++ 98 mode. Let's go ahead and take this back up to C++ 11 mode so that this will in fact compile. It does. And then we are going to comment out this main and create a different main. But I need a helper class. This is, it's a helper to me. It helps me. Okay, I have created my helper class here, and the point of this helper class is to help us reason about object lifetime. So I've got my pair one and pair two. I'm gonna go ahead and create an object of type pair one, and it's going to take two helpers, and I'm going to initialize it with two helpers. Now I'm going to put Compiler Explorer in the, oh, I need my closing brace, in execute mode here so that we can see what it's actually doing. And we can see that it is constructed to helpers and it is destroyed to helpers. So it created this helper and it created this helper and then it created those in place here. So there's no copy or move or anything. And if you followed my other videos on this channel, you really shouldn't be surprised that it's able to construct these two things in place. Now I do have O3 turned on, so let's just go ahead and take this to O0. Do we expect anything to change? No, I've created two objects in place. Okay, now I have my pair two, which has quote, perfect forwarding here and it has a constructor that takes a first and a second and um, forwards those into here. So let's see what happens if I make this a object of type pair two. You know what, I, let's get rid of this unhelpful name P1 and make this P2, pair two. Now, this is quote, perfect forwarding. I used this in the best way that I possibly could. I am passing our value references and I am constructing this object. But what do I see? I see that in fact, I still have to perform a move operation to actually initialize first and second here. Now I'm currently on clang, trunk, and O0. Let's take this to O3. Nothing changes. I take this to GCC with O3, nothing's gonna change. 
So we still have to, what we're doing effectively is we're creating these parameters to our constructor and then we are moving those in to the local objects. So the whole point of this exercise was to get you thinking about object lifetime and really what does it mean when we move or forward an object around. Now this is a very big topic, but clearly in this case, if we are 100% our main concern is performance, then we probably should have never provided this with a constructor because we have public members here, first and second, these are public members. Uh, what's the point in providing a constructor here? Now you can make arguments about knowing the order uh, that the objects are going to be passed in and such, but um, well, go ahead and play with it for yourself. And that's food for thought for thinking about object lifetime. So review, pair one, I get the two objects created in place perfectly. Pair two, they do have to go through the constructor and this does affect what the compiler can do with our code. Wow. Okay, super long intro to our chapter two. I'm gonna make a quick bookmark for this so that I can share it with you. And now we will start talking about chapter three's videos. So let's go ahead and clear this out. Here's hoping I saved it correctly. Chapter three, using lambdas. Now again, like I did in chapter two, I'm going to give you the list of videos to watch and then I'm going to give you the exercises and I'm not going to have fancy links popping up because that just didn't work nearly as well as I wanted it to with chapter one. So in chapter three, we're going to focus on actually utilizing lambdas in your code and what that means. So the first episode for you to watch is episode 125, the optimal way to return from a function. This episode, we're going to talk about more about object lifetime and understanding return value optimization. The next episode to watch is 132, lambdas in fold expressions. Now in C++ 17, we got fold expressions. And of course, lambdas can be used in fold expressions because they can be used pretty much darn near anywhere in C++ 17. And then episode 61, storage duration with lambdas. Now, like I said before, I'm gonna have this list in the notes underneath this video, so you can check them out. You can also go to the playlist, which will be linked below. Um, lambdas, just like anything else, have storage duration and they have their own lifetime. This is something you have to think about to really be able to think about lambdas effectively. Next up, and we do have a little bit more this time, is lambdas for free. And this is talking about what kind of optimizations the compiler does around lambdas. And we saw some of that already when we were going over the answers from chapter two. Episode 93, custom comparators. This talks about providing your own custom comparators for the associative containers in C++. And of course, we have to bring this back to lambdas. So episode 94, lambdas as comparators, and this is about using lambdas as custom comparators in our associative containers. And then episode 95, transparent comparators. And moving on, episode 96, transparent lambda comparators. And this will kind of bring home this whole topic of where and how lambdas can be used most effectively and what they can do for us in the standard library. So after you have done watching those eight episodes, like I said, it's a little bit more this time, but most of these are, are pretty short. Then you will come back here and work on uh, this exercise. I'm just gonna paste it here instead of making you watch me type it. And be sure to take advantage of our helpful format text option here. Now, I have two different lambdas in fold expressions. Let's take this up to C17 mode, otherwise this is never gonna compile. Right, so this isn't compiling at the moment because I don't have either of these pound defined set. And if I had this in C11 mode, I promise you it would not have compiled because I'm using C17 fold expressions. So I'm going to compile with opt one. Now these two constructs look like they're doing pretty much the same thing. 
Here I am creating a lambda, and then I'm utilizing that lambda in the fold expression. This is opt1. Now we're going to take a very high level look at this, and we're going to see that this generated 449 operations with GCC. Now in opt2, I am creating a lambda inside the fold expression, and both of them I am doing reference capture here and here. Both of them have auto parameter functions, and in both of them I am doing this puts statement here. Okay, I'm going to switch to opt-in 2, and I am going to see that I have, remember the last number is 449 operations, instructions, function calls, however you want to call them. I've got 1,589 when I'm using option 2. So your job is to tell me Why are these two generating such completely different code output? Why is option two generating so much more code than option one? So investigate that and then come back here next week for chapter four where we discuss what it was actually doing. So thank you for watching this somewhat longer than expected episode of C++ Weekly. I hope you are enjoying this class. Be sure to subscribe and come back next week.